This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Check out the new YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Hi, I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. As you know, we have a number of opportunities for you to get to know opera and our current season by tuning in here to UCSD-TV. One of our most exciting offerings is Stars in the Salon. This series is an opportunity for you, our audience, to meet the singers, the conductors, and the stage directors who create our productions. Taped before a live audience, the artists discuss their roles, the music, and the stories behind the operas. It's especially entertaining and informative for those of you who are new to opera. Join us now for Stars in the Salon, and I'll see you at the opera. Well, good evening. I'm Nick Ravellis, the Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. Some of you may notice that I have a few bandages over here, and, and some of you might have been in the Sunday matinee performance of Moby Dick and heard the announcement that I quote unquote fell off my bike. <laughs> it was a lot more complicated than that, thank you very much. But I'm, I'm fine, I'm well, and uh, delighted to be here. Actually, I've been telling people I was attacked by Moby Dick, and am. Um, <laughs> and am seeking vengeance on the cast of Don Pasquale. But uh, of course, we're here to talk about our next production, Don Pasquale by Donizetti, and it's a welcome uh, return of this absolutely charming and effervescent comedy uh, from 1843. It was first performed in Paris at the Teatro Italien, um, which obviously um, focused on Italian literature. Uh, but it soon made its way to Italy and the rest of the world and has been conquering the world with its comic delight ever since. I want to introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, making her uh, long-awaited debut with us, the soprano who will be singing the role of Norina, Danielle Denise. <laughs> Sitting next to her, a bass who has been here since <laughs> since 1973, I understand, and at one point was a member of our Young Artists program back in, in Tito Capobianco days, John Del Carlo. <laughs> and of course, John will be singing the role of Don Pasquale. Next to him, also making his debut with us, from Genoa, I believe, Maestro Marco Guidarini, our conductor. Next to him, the tenor who will be singing the role of Ernesto. He was last here singing the role of Nadir in The Pearl Fishers by Bizet, Charles Castronovo. <laughs> our baritone as Dr. Malatesta. He was last seen here in our 2010 production of La Boheme, I believe, baritone Jeff Matzi. And at the end of the line, way over there at the end of the table, our director, our stage director, last here directed Faust uh, last season, and he is the originating director of this wonderful production, Don Pasquale, David Gately. <laughs> David, I want to begin with you, because this really was your idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and it's actually, it's actually been uh, very beneficial for us. We've rented this, this production countless times. It's become a cash cow, which is really terrific. Um, and, and it is, of course, absolutely delightful. But what made you think in the first place of translating the story of Pasquale from the 1840s Rome to 1840s Nevada City or Sacramento or California in the Gold Rush era. What, what it's probably what? more like Tucson, Arizona. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> um, it was an interesting process. Uh, uh, an old friend of mine ran the Chautauqua Opera in upstate New York. Her name was Linda Jackson. And Linda wanted to do a new production of Don Pasquale, and so we were talking about ways that we might do it because she didn't want to do a sort of uh, a standard traditional production of it. Um, 
I was looking for something that would give the piece charm and wit and, uh, and a little something that we could relate to as, a, uh, as an audience. So the, um, the ideas came slowly. I can't even tell you, because it was way back in 1991. <laughs> I can't tell you how all those ideas you know, formed. Uh, and it's changed a lot since then. Uh, not a lot, a little bit since then. But um, I decided that it might be fun to have Pasquale be a character. He's, he, he's such a quintessential Italian character. I thought it might be fun to put him in a new environment um, uh, where he was a little bit of a, of a fish out of water. So I said, what if he like moved to the new world seeking his fortune and opened a hotel and uh, brought his young uh, nephew Ernesto along with him so that when Ernesto grew up, he could take over the business. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, that's what he did. And Ernesto sort of assimilated into the uh, uh, American way of life. And Pasquale stayed this old Italian character who w had his old ways and wanted to arrange a marriage for Ernesto. And it, it, that, you know, that was just the way things were done in the old country. And so it became kind of a clash, not only of uh, age, which it, uh, Pasquale is often played as a clash of uh, an older generation versus a younger generation, but it became a cultural clash as well because it was sort of the new kind of American spirit versus the old world um, way of, of raising uh, the kids. <laughs> and then um, I started to draw from all the references. I said, oh, well, we do it in the Old West. Maybe we can you know, draw on those references from Bonanza and uh, Gunsmoke <laughs> and those spaghetti westerns that we, that we grew up with with Clint Eastwood, where interestingly enough, you know, they were filmed in Italy by an um, Italian director and the, most of the cast were Italian, and so when they were filming it, they actually spoke to each other in their own languages. So Clint would be speaking in English and his compatriots would be speaking in Italian back and forth. And in the end, they dubbed it all anyway, you know, so it was, uh, it was uh, kind of like doing an Italian opera with titles. <laughs> a little bit like that. So anyway, that's where they developed, and I started just drawing from all those references, those sort of comic references about, uh, uh, from those westerns where mm -hmm. I grew up. The plot is really as old as theater, is it not? An old man wanting to marry a, a, a young girl. And, um, I mean, it, it was also a, a, a plot in Commedia. Absolutely. Pantalone, is this not Pantalone? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so it's, it's, it's wonderful on so many different levels. Yeah, I understand it's also, well, I guess I remember it, it is also a very prop heavy show. There's a few props. <laughs> the prop people here, you know, they joke that maybe there's like, you know, one whole uh, warehouse that is just the props of this particular production. <laughs> the, the set designer is a, is a fellow uh, named Tony Fanning, who's an old friend of mine. And Tony was originally um, studied at Yale to be a, a set designer, a stage designer. Uh, but then, um, as many people do, uh, when they graduate from Yale and they have... <laughs> thousands and thousands of dollars of debt, they decide, oh, I think I'll go do the movies. So Tony moved to LA and got into the movies. And um, even when he was doing this, he was already designing and art directing movies. And so when we were doing it here, we, he had all the access to these incredible places in, um, in LA that were done for the movies. And you know, the set is so intricate and so beautiful and you could do, you, it, you can almost see him going, okay, now if there was a shot over here, this is what is behind. <laughs> so every little inch of the set is designed almost to be like a movie set. Mm. It's, it's quite amazing and quite beautiful. That's cool. Uh, Maestro Guidarini, um, this is your first time here in San Diego and we're delighted yes. to have you here Thanks. in, in Thanks. San Diego. It's, it, it's exciting. Um, now having an authentic Italian conduct authentic Italian repertoire is very yes. important to us yes. uh, in terms of getting the style just right. Yeah. And uh, Donizetti is a little different from Bellini, is a little different yes. from early Verdi. And we're very lucky in San Diego to have in our season back to back two Italian comic operas, one from that golden age of comic opera, uh, Il Barbieri and Don Pasquale, which in my mind almost ends the tradition in 1843. What, what are the differences between these two takes on comedy in Italian operas? Yes. 
Well, the things that you mentioned earlier, the, the fact that you know, certain characters of the uh, Italian uh, comic operas are, they actually uh, take things that come from the past, particularly from what we call a Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte has a reference in what the masks were like characters like, uh, for instance, Bartolo in Barbieri di Siviglia or Don Pasquale in the case of our opera, they actually are um, somehow um, a long-term uh, fruit of what uh, the Commedia dell'Arte was. So you had, for instance, um, Pantalone as the stereotype, as the uh, um, epitome of being, uh, let's say, an old guy with certain peculiar way of beings, <laughs> they, uh, they ultimately they end up to, to transform these characteristics into real characters. Like in the case of, uh, at least this is my opinion, and it's the same for, for a Colombina that becomes somehow Rosina in Barbiere mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and Norina, and Norina mm -hmm. in Do Pasquale. But th there are millions of, of, of comic operas of this kind, the Ori de Belcanto. Basically, the, you have always this, uh, somehow this trio where there is the, the, the old gentleman, the young lady, and uh, the youngster that was basically that. Then you have a fourth character, which is the baritón, usually, in fact, that uh, ultimately uh, always look and makes you think about Figaro, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The Malatesta somehow. So as you can see, the, 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 the links and the similarities are obvious. Generally, the baritón is as well the engine of the story that is, in fact, even in Do Pasquale, Malatesta is the one that actually drives the events in a certain way, so that actually has the, the plot of the, uh, in his hands. Whether, you know, Don Pasquale remains in the line of what we are saying before, mm -hmm. Norina remains, uh, etc. And Ernesto, uh, the tenor, uh, too, in a certain way, they, the youngster, etc. Plus, you know, inside these general characteristics, they, they do belong to this past, but they do come from uh, La Comedia dell'Arte. Well, these are characters are that the Italian audience would have recognized immediately. Immediately, immediately, immediately. So, but there are differences, just to, to come back to what, you know, what was your question, in the sense that, to, to me, the, 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 the char characters, uh, for instance, of Barbiere, since you are going to hear Barbiere here after uh, our Don Pasquale, they are really strictly connected to this idea. First of all, we are talking about a little earlier, mm -hmm. little earlier. And in that case, there is, of course, there are these literary roots that they come from Beaumarchais, of course, the, the uh, Figaro trilogy that, that is influenced uh, too by, by the Comédie de l'Arte, but has this sense of theater that actually is strictly connected with the literary source. In the case of Don Pasquale, you have a, some kind of an elaboration and of uh, uh, the situation is put in context uh, of the Roman context, let's say, of the middle uh, 19th century. And to me, it becomes a little more, compared to, to the Barbieri, com a little more towards uh, what we call la commedia borghese, that is uh, a sort of daily life, uh, uh, realistic daily life situation, kind of situation. So therefore, even the, 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 the comicity or the, 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 the situation among uh, characters, they are actually influenced by this uh, um, ground idea of sort of daily life uh, uh, situations. In, in this respect, uh, for instance, the character of, of Don Pasquale is uh, quite different from uh, Don Bartolo, because Bartolo can be sort of seen as a sort of stereotype of the baritone, general mm -hmm. baritone, whether Don Pasquale has moments where actually one feels somehow uh, this pathetic uh, side of, of, the, of the character, especially after the famous mm -hmm, mm -hmm. schiaffo, no? Because he has this moment of, mm, little moment of pathetic and uh, <laughs> which is, so, so in this respect, you would not find an element of this kind in Rossini, in, in, the, in the, just to, 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 to bring out the, these differences. But otherwise, I mean, more or less, we are talking about the same mm -hmm. typology of style, uh, Speaking more musically, uh, it's uh, as well the characteristic of the scores, uh, a score like uh, the Barbiere one is really uh, the typical bel canto virtuoso uh, like way of writing. Lots of coloratura, in, uh, lots of coloratura. rapid passages and that kind of Not thing. Not that you, we don't have these elements in, 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 uh, in Don Pasquale, but they start to transform into something, as I was saying before, that sort of goes a little bit away from those 
closed forms of areas with the, the capo, etc., to become a little more connected with the, the sort of uh, daily theatrical mm -hmm. uh, idea of the of, of the plot. Mm -hmm. um, so, everybody else, do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I, because I, I really would like to go with this a little bit in terms of the singing, because, well, like in the case of John, uh, you've done Dr. Bartolo in uh, the Rossini and obviously Pasquale. How are they, how are they different to sing? Um, and maybe other Rossini characters, because you've also done, you, you've, uh, well, you did Italiana for us. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, Pasquale, I think for me, is, is not as, um, uh, like Bartolo. Bartolo, there's a little bit more patter involved. Uh, Bartolo, especially in the aria and in, in some of the rest of the music. Um, Pasquale actually has some, some more legato singing, mm. and that's kind of nice. It's not much, <laughs> but uh, when he does do it, uh, like when after the slap and has those beautiful lines, e finito don Pasquale, finito. I like I like that too. I mean, I, I love the patter and I, I, I enjoy it very much, but I really like to be able to sing some cantilena, some line. And so for me, it's, it's, it's good. Italiana is more, uh, lots of pitter patter in that too, as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jeff, how about you? Because you've also sung Figaro in Barbiere. Well, the, the one thing I find, diff the main difference between sort of the Barber and, and the Pasquale is, like Maestro was saying, it's almost, it's starting in that direction of through composition. It's heading toward more towards the verismo. It's more that, that you have, like he's, he was saying, with the reality of Don Pasquale, with this idea that, that he's, the character of Bartolo can sometimes feel, you feel like he's over the top, whereas Pasquale, when there's a truth about him, you really are sympathetic to him. Mm. And the recitative are less with the harpsichord, and more, it's more through direction. So you're starting to sort of lose that it's heading more towards the Verdi recitative in the middle of the Verdi. So it's a transition piece musically in, in the eras. Mm -hmm. And it's, there, there's much more truth involved in Pasquale. Um, Malatesta, again, he's very much like Figaro. He does run around. He makes everything happen. Right. He, you know, he sets a, the ball in motion with Pasquale. Then he goes to Noreen and gets her going. And everything sort of goes. And then he's got to fix it again when, when all of a sudden here comes, you know, the tenor to mess everything up. <laughs> you know, that I didn't get a chance to tell him and fill him in. So in the middle of everything, while it's going crazy, you have to fill him in on the whole story and say, just let me take care of it. Mm. And eventually everything works out at the end. So. A lot, lot of pathos in, in yeah. Pasquale. Huh? Yeah. 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 Something to, to, to put it in context, 1843 the, is the premiere of Don Pasquale. It's also the premiere of The Flying Dutchman, of Wagner, which is sort of strange to, and within a month of each other, which, is, which seems odd that they're such completely different pieces. But uh, um, also, Maestro, is not the orchestra a little larger for Pasquale than it is for some of the earlier Donizetti pieces? Well, as you, as you know, Donizetti wrote uh, an enormous amount of titles, like almost uh, 70, over 70 something years, like that, something yeah. like that. So, and uh, he died at a very early age, when he was like uh, 42 or something, or something. And plus, the last years of his life, he was... Uh, uh, really uh, having enormous troubles um, in terms of he had this sort of mental illness. So, uh, so it, that means that he wrote at uh, an extremely high speed. Probably the the, uh, the score itself of Don Pasquale has been written probably in three weeks or something, which is incredible. I mean, you can hardly. I always mention this because uh, you can hardly copy it in, th in three weeks. I mean, it's, which is literally is uh, so just to give you an idea of the sheer talent. Of, uh, of such a composer, but uh, the, uh, the composers of those uh, generation, the one, the most famous one, of course, is Rossini, had an, an extraordinary ease in writing because, uh, well, the uh, actual composing of the bel canto goes very much through patterns, through musical patterns. So it's like uh, jazz patterns, if you want. Mm -hmm. Once you know actually how uh, to. Uh, drive your musical line or to write a certain way of accompaniment, then it's obviously for such talented composers was relatively easy. I'm just I'm saying this to come back to your uh, to your question because uh, um, generally speaking, uh, the uh, orchestration was kind of standard, both as if you were uh, uh, composing for let's say opera seria, 
like uh, Anna Bolena, Lucrezia Borgia, Maria Stuarda in the case of, uh, of uh, Donizetti. Or uh, for Rossini, if he was writing, I don't know, Semiramide, Tancredi, instead of uh, the Barbiere or uh, L'Occasione Fai Ladro or Italiano. So you had a certain, a certain typology of, of a standard of the orchestra. In that standard orchestra, they were uh, like, uh, for instance, two or four horns, three trombones, uh, two trumpets, uh, of course, uh, two double woodwinds. So it was that sort of instrument, collective mm -hmm. instrument. Of course, uh, we are talking about uh, as well instruments that in those times were lighter than uh, are today. So like brass instruments were much smaller with uh, uh, not such a powerful sound. So, but basically that was uh, a sort of um, uh, style that like conceived a, form, a formula, a, a a formula the, where the instrument was conceived th th that way. Of course, in modern time uh, performances, one of the problems that a conductor has to go through is the fact of adapting to a modern orchestra uh, and uh, for a correct balance with the, uh, with, the, with the voices, the dynamics that are written in the score and the way this collective instrument that is the orchestra is used. Mm -hmm. May I add a different pitch? As well, yes. the pitch the pitch was lower lower than what about a half a step maybe or, or oh, maybe almost yes yes so everything now is mm, strings high. were with gut strings so, so I mean the sound of the strings was not as uh, let's say metallic uh, as the instrument we have nowadays so okay. it's uh, altogether if you consider as well that uh, the typical Italianate theater is not. Uh, uh, more than uh, maybe 1,000 seats means uh, one third of what we have here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just, just to give you the sense of, it was much more intimate and as well the size of the orchestra, which apart, apart the number of uh, different instruments were, were actually smaller. So. so there's a lot to think about, <laughs> a lot to think about. Danielle, this is your debut in the role of Norina as well as your debut here, but I can't think of another bel canto role in the repertoire that would fit you better than Norina. <laughs> um, Why do you say that, Nick? I have no idea. <laughs> just just having, having seen you in action on DVD in uh, <laughs> Giulio Cesare from Glyndebourne, and I think, oh, that old Norina would be perfect for her. And of course, this has Especially a lot Especially gunslinging Norina. Uh, oh, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and of course, this has, has a lot to say about uh, the ear of our general director, Ian Campbell, and uh, thinking, you know, what a great fit it would be for you. But how is the vocal fit for somebody who's been doing a lot of Handel, Monteverdi, Rameau? That's right. We talked about this the other day. Um, this is my second Donizetti role. Um, I've spent most of my uh, early years doing Handel and Mozart and a few different things, but one-offs. Uh, I think in Puccini, I've only ever sung Lauretta and Gianni Schicchi and uh, of Verdi, uh, Nannetta, and Falstaff, and those two roles really suited me well, so I knew that I had a clear understanding of the style, but I did want to wait until I was vocally ready because of, as Maestro and John were saying, the depth and size of the orchestra and the orchestration of this kind of a role is much heavier than a Mozart role, um, and especially much more than a Handelian role. Um, so vocally, I waited till I was ready, so therefore it does fit me now. Um, I did my first Adina at Glyndebourne this summer, and it was perfect. It really felt wonderful in my voice, and and actually, I would say it even lifted my vocal chops mm -hmm. up to a different level. So I think Narina is going to do that as well. Now, just for our audience, Adina, of course, is the heroine in the Elixir, Elixir of Love. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I find this beginning of bel canto roles uh, to be, at this stage in my career, infinitely more challenging, actually. And that's not to say that Mozart is not challenging and Handel isn't, but of course I have more experience in those roles, so uh, taking these on for the first time is more daunting. The other difference that I find is that the voice is a little bit more exposed in this bel canto, you know, the beauty of the sound and, mm. and the, the, the there are sort of, uh, you could almost call them sort of like golden rules of bel canto, where you you know you have to have the good line, you have to have legato, you have to have diction. I mean, it's not that you don't have to have that in other opera, but the attention that's drawn towards that when you're singing these kind of roles is is just different for me. And so um, you know, uh, 
that's my challenge. But I mean, I waited till I felt that I was ready to do that. So, and this production is so great because it's, it's incredibly, it's actually kind of aerobic, even though we're not really doing <laughs> somersaults or anything, but we're all exhausted after rehearsal because there's, there's so much um, detail in the staging. So we, it's, it contains this element that almost feels like choreography, even though it's not. Um, it's, it makes it for, it feels like Monty Python or something, you know? It's like a very, it's, it's got lots of stuff in it. And it's, and that's great. It means that we become very tight as an ensemble. And um, yeah, this has been a great experience That's interesting. Charles, I want to bring you into the conversation because just, just following up on, on, uh, on what Danielle said, um, the, the, the detail of comedy um, must be, what's the word? Uh, you, you really have to have your concentration about you, I would think. Um, are you finding that a challenge in, in rehearsals? I, I always rather play the brooding part, but, <laughs> <clears throat> but I do have quite a few um, comedy roles, like Elixir, for example, Neborino. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a timing thing. I definitely think that uh, comedy is much harder than doing something more serious. <clears throat> but when you have very clear direction, <clears throat> like from David, from our director, um, <clears throat> it helps give you the right path. So it's more just uh, being a little bit brave. With comedy, in a way, you have to be more brave than when you do something more dramatic. Hmm. You know, because, you know, when you're brooding, you can go down and, you know, get into yourself. <laughs> but with comedy, you have to basically look like a fool in front of people and, and feel comfortable with that, which is good. It's a good thing. So, so yeah, for me, it's fun. I don't mind. I, I, you know. Is Ernesto a fool? <clears throat> he's an innocent fool, he's I think. Fool he's a fool for love. Yes. <laughs> he's, um, he's very honest, so very sincere. I wouldn't say he's my favorite character. I would never do anything that he does in this opera, <laughs> not even one. But, uh, but he is very honest, very sincere, um, which makes him, um, well, very likable, actually, I think. Even, even if he's a little bit silly, he's, you know, the honesty gives him, you know, the character. Mm. Uh, it's interesting that there's been no half-nude pin-up picture of you to coincide <laughs> yeah. with, this, with this particular production as opposed to the Pearl Fishers. Uh, but you will be taking a bath on stage. Yes, well, uh, every time I come to San Diego, I need to work out a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, this are you time I do have your, a bath scene. Are you ready for your close-up, I guess, is the, <laughs> yes, is the exactly, question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, luckily, uh, there's a, a very well-placed towel, but, uh, yeah, I'll show at least some, you know, some shoulders and a stuff. Little, so, yeah. A little shoulders. <laughs> I love it. That's but great. at least there's not a giant poster of me outside <laughs> with my shirt off. Sorry. No, actually, <laughs> the poster is Miss Nibs right here um, with her sh with her sharpshooter. Have you seen the poster? I have. It's How can you miss it? What are you talking about? It's gigantic. It's just huge. And there you are in all your glory with your pistol and your 10-gallon hat. That's, that's great. Are you going to tell them how it was done? I don't I'm know. I'm not sure if I'm permitted to tell how it was oh, done. Is, he, is I Ian might here? Keep it a secret. Oh, hello, Ian. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why not? Go why? ahead. That's what that, that's what this event is for. Really? Shall we share some secrets? Sure. Why not? Well, does anyone remember the cover for the poster of Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts? Mm -hmm. Well, they did the same thing with my headshot. They they imposed my head on someone else's body, oh. <laughs> just like uh, Julia Roberts on Pretty Woman. Oh, they I just had pasted it. a U in. I, I had actually... Yeah, it's pretty slick. I actually thought maybe I'd actually come out for the photo shoot. At yeah, I actually asked her, I, after I saw the picture in the program, I said, oh, did you come out here for a photo shoot? <laughs> he did, he did say that. I mean, because you're in the costume, and you know, you it look, totally looks, you it looks know. It's really good, actually. It's amazing It looks Photoshop perfect. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it really does. Uh, John. I was surprised to hear uh, when we spoke the other day, and our audience may also be surprised, that you did a string of votons in your career. And I wonder if you just elaborate a little bit on that particular wrinkle. I think that's so, so interesting. Because you're, you know, as I said also in the, the interview that will be going online, hopefully in the next, in the next week, uh, you're kind of the go-to guy now for basso buffo roles. One of them, one of them. <laughs> but um, uh, Votan. How, how that happened, yes. Votan, that's really Oh, gosh. I, uh, I was singing um, uh, none of that repertoire. The only repertoire <laughs> I did that even came close to that was Kotner in De Meistersinger. 
where you know the uh, he has that little uh, little arietta there where he explains the rules, and I was doing it in Chicago. Uh, oh gosh, I think probably uh, sometime in the 85, 84, 85 uh, time period, and at the time, um, Marek Yanovsky, the conductor, was conducting it. And he came up to me one day, said, have you ever thought about singing Wotan? And I said, looked at him, I said, no. And he, have you ever done, no, just Kotner and him. I said, well, I think your voice, you know, I think you might have it. So I said, oh, okay, well, can you learn Die Frist ist um from uh, Flying Dutchman for me in about three or four weeks? And I said, okay, so I'd like to hear you sing that. And so I <laughs> scrambled and learned it with, uh, with Fiore, Maestro Fiore. And I talked to Tom Stewart at the time, who was doing the Meister Singer, and William Johns, the tenor. I said, what do you guys think? You're old hands at this Wagner stuff. What do you think? Do I have the, the chops to do Wotan? And, well, your voice is big, and you're about 36, 37. OK, yeah, why not try it? So <laughs> frantically learned it, and I got on stage and uh, sang the aria. Very good, very good. Next thing I know, he's offering me the ring cycle in Cologne. <laughs> I went, wow. And I th he says, I think you're the next Votan. I went, oh my gosh. So, <laughs> so I went to Cologne and I did the, uh, I ended up doing uh, the uh, Rheingold Votan and the Siegfried Mander. And it was okay. It wasn't great, but it was good. It was good. I didn't do the Valkyrie because I didn't feel, I just didn't feel comfortable enough. So I did this, the, the symphony of that, the Gürtseni Symphony Orchestra. And then I went on to do the staging in Cologne. And that's how that started. <laughs> and That's so when, when, when the uh, Cologne Opera hired me as a, guest, as a guest singer, they included that, but they also included Rossini and Donizetti. And so I was doing like 35 performances for three years, including <laughs> Rheingold, Wotan, Donner, Gunther. I also did Gunther and Goethe Debron. So I had that, and I also had the, uh, this uh, comedic. Yeah, can you imagine me doing both of those? It's never, it was never, probably not done that, I don't think it, you know, it's not just not done. So I had to make a decision at some point. Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go in this repertoire or am I going to have fun and do the comedy stuff? And all of a sudden it made sense to me because I had such a great success with Elisir there and, and the Rossini stuff. And it just naturally uh, came to pass that uh, that, that uh, ended up with this. So that's how that started. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. I love that story. Yeah. Um, uh, so beginning with Maestro, I'd like to ask, um, what was your first encounter with Don Pasquale, and and was it an opera that you liked immediately? Uh, was it something no, that, that, that you were attracted I to? Uh, I think I played it. I mean, I was a, I was a cellist. My first instrument is the cello. Yeah. Cello, so, oh. and I played for a while uh, when I was very young. I played a two or three years, you know. And I, we actually did one that was in Genoa, I'll, um, even before they rebuilt the Carlo Felice. I was very, very young, and there was a, the, a young Enzo Dara, which was in the school of Montarsolo, that yeah. sort of, yeah. um, mm. Montarsolo, Corena, Bruscantini, yeah. in, in different, so, so, uh, so I was playing in it. And then, of course, uh, then I conducted the only once before, before this, this time, that was in Vancouver, like uh, 10 years ago or something. And, um, but I've seen several, during the years, I've seen even even Raimondi doing his. Uh, and that was so hard for him, I remember, because uh, being used to sing all the Verdi and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, or Don Giovanni. Uh, yeah, you uh, wouldn't immediately go, think no, of uh, you, you the voice of Raimondi singing like, uh, Pasquale. Of course, yes. Uh, of course, uh, Ruggiero was already in his, saying his last years because we did together. What was it? We did, we did the, yes, in Lombardia La Prima Crociata we did together with it, where there is a huge bass role, Pagano. And he was telling me, you know, I should do maybe something lighter every now and then. <laughs> because he, always he was always doing Basilio. Oh, always yeah. doing Basilio. It's a it's very tall guy, single <laughs> and, and, um, and, and so he wanted to do Pasquale. But he found it extremely difficult, which in fact it is, because, um, uh, uh, well, there is first of all a problem of tessitura uh, in Don Pasquale, because although you need a bass, or, but you know, uh, actually sits, can sit pre pretty high, mm -hmm. for, for, depending mm -hmm. on, so if you are a basso, of course, then you have, uh, uh, like in the case of uh, Giovanni, no, you have, it's not the same thing, of course, but uh, if you have a bass singing Giovanni, then of course the canzonetta is hard. And if you have a baritone, bass baritone, then the scene with the commendatore yeah. gets very heavy because, mm -hmm. of, because of the balance with the, the porello and, um, 
in the trio and the commendatore. But in, I'm not saying that it's quite exactly the same with Pasquale, but uh, there is something about, about uh, Pasquale. That is, at, some po at some moment, it's a typical buffo, ribattuto, with a lot of words uh, to be spoken very quickly. And then you have uh, the legato, and uh, that legato doesn't sit very low, like in the typical bass uh, mm -hmm. uh, registro, but uh, you know, in this sort of middle-high tessitura, which then, of course, that's why probably someone like John, that is, uh, it's plus. You know, I'm not so astonished, though, the, about the thing of the Wagneria thing that, that happened to you, because in yeah, fact, you need a... The size of the voice, the range, you know, the size and range. They heard that and they thought, "Oh, a echo." You know, oh, there's the next Botan. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, what about the rest of you? Your first uh, uh, encounter with Pasquale, Jeff? Um, I was trying to think. I think this is actually my seventh or eighth production of it. Really? Uh, I actually did this once before with David in uh, in Louisville, and I also did it with. Charles, he told me it was the first time he did it, and then and the only time, and the only time aside <laughs> from this, we did it in Boston together back in 2001 or two or something like that. Um, the other association I have is I don't know if you've seen the Xerox commercial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a Xerox commercial a couple of years ago of, of sort of the office brand where they showed everything in office, and they went and they looked at the guy that was sitting in his office. And they said we had to give him his own printer and close the door. And they said, why? And they opened the door, and they've got the uh, Pasquale duet being sung. That was me doing both voices. Oh. Uh, and, and, and so, I, I mean, I've always had sort of, I mean, Pasquale has always been around my life in many ways. It's sort of a funny thing. But, um, yeah, that took all of 10 minutes to record, which was very fascinating. <laughs> He's but, still uh, getting paid every time they play. No, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the recession hit and Xerox took all of the commercials off TV. So it's oh, no. <laughs> Charles, so now you haven't you haven't done Ernesto since uh, 2001. Yeah, I think it was 2001 was the only time I did it. Jeff and I were in that show in Boston. So how is it uh, bringing it back into the voice? It's actually difficult to tell you the truth. Um, um, it's it's a very high tessitura role. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot be it's very strange. You, you cannot be too light with it because it, it really has some serious bel canto lines with a lot of passion. At the same time, you can't get too romantic with it because the tessitura is just too damn high. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to give too much voice. You really have to find uh, a balance, which uh, has been difficult because I, um, I was a little bit sick right before I came here. I came from Vienna. It was very cold. I got sick. But, uh, yeah, it's starting to come back. It's, but the challenge of the of the, the role vocally is to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. um, in the last couple years, I've started to sing roles that are a little bit more full, so to come back to something where you really have to stay quite controlled is a little tricky, but uh, for me, that's part of, uh, of uh, the good part of the challenge is mm -hmm. you know trying to find that balance. So yeah, I'll try my best. <laughs> and, and may I add, he does a fantastic job. Yeah, the whole you. cast, the whole oh, cast, by the way, wonderful. David included, Maestro, it's Fantastic. Couldn't get a better cast, so I think you'll all enjoy it. <laughs> and, and Danny, for you too, it, it, it's a similar uh, challenge in terms yeah. of the fact that um, no, it lies high? It, it, it does lie high, and it's it, exactly as Charles was saying vocally for me as well. It's written, um, it sits in a part of the voice for the soprano, which is like there's a lot of writing in the passaggio area, which is a very difficult little part of your voice to navigate. Um, so the richness of the composition actually makes you want to enlarge and, and sort of relax into the sound. But then, of course, if you have to keep singing high Bs and Cs and Ds by the end of the piece as well, you have to be very careful with just how much richness you allow into the sound during the other bits of writing in order to have enough steam for the end. So um, I'll be learning that as I do this because, of course, it's the first time and pacing is really what you, it's the one thing you don't have when you do a role for the first time. And it's, the, it's what you learn as you, as you take on a role more, more and more. So the other thing that I find really wonderful about Pasquale, I'm talking about Commedia dell'arte, um, is that we all have the challenge of finding the balance between allowing these characters to be humorous, but not allowing them to become caricatures. Um, and 
we've worked we've been working on that you know there there actually is a lot of pathos in this piece i mean even talking about that moment with the slap um you know all of these characters can risk turning into sort of parodies of themselves so narina can turn into a sort of petulant sassy uh fiery uh whippet type character and you know he can be sort of buffo and the, t the silly tenor and you know like this kind of thing so um but there it actually is a lot more profoundly written um than that so the the trick is not turning it into a shtick um and too slapstick and and at the same time allowing ourselves and the audience to have a great time with it so it's it's two things there's a vo there's what we're trying to do vocally which is you know to keep a balance of the of pacing and and good line, good singing, uh, without overblowing, but also what, what we're trying to do dramatically with the role. But I think that's what makes it so great. I mean, that's, that's what this is all about. So hopefully we'll have that balance for opening night. Let's take some questions from the audience. With a great experience represented at the dais, I have a question that uh, I would like every one of you to respond to. Could you tell us your most, most disturbing event ever <laughs> during or before, at the performance that you can remember and you don't want to talk about? Who's going first? No, I can't go first. I can't, I have to go last because I have to think of it. I, it came to mind exactly as soon as you said that. I said, oh, because I told the guys the other day, in this production, um, I have to get on top of a horse, uh, plastic <laughs> horse. It's a big plastic horse. First thing I said to David, is that going to hold me? Oh, yes, there's no problem. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So um, in, in this production, the stairs, to, to, to help you get on the steps, there are upstage stairs on the, on the opposite side of the horse that you would normally get on, right? So that brought into play my right leg. Now, 20 years ago, I was at the Châtelet Opera doing Lulu, and uh, the second act, there was my character went, ran off stage, and I was standing backstage. I said, "Well, if the director's going to go on, I'll just, I'll just, you know, go down the steps off of the rake stage. A rake stage means slightly elevated from the front to the back. So there were about four or five, maybe five or six steps that I needed to step on to get off the stage. So I said, "Well, he's going to go on, so I'll, I'll go out to the audience and watch." So I put my foot." my right foot on the top step and the whole stairs collapsed. Oh. That's a rehearsal. Now there's a rehearsal. The whole steps, all the stairs collapsed and I fell on this bottom leg on, on top of it. My bottom fell on and I went, heard this huge crunch, mm. crack. Next thing I know, just a split second later, I, the pain hit and I started screaming, my leg, my leg. Turns out I both broke both bones uh, completely right above the oh. ankle. So that's the worst, <laughs> the worst thing that's ever happened to me. If that's, the, you know, <laughs> anybody top that? <laughs> no, I can't. Top not, that. not as far as like breaking a leg or anything oh. like that, but, but I can think of back when I was, it was '87 or '88 at Wolf Trap, and we were doing Giovanni, and you'll find that costumers love to put you in sort of nice crushed velvet pants and things like that, but they don't have a lot of give, and I think all of us have had some moments where we do this. So at the beginning of the second act, when you're doing the trio, I was to kneel down next to Leporello, and as I knelt down, let's just say I ripped my pants from stem to stern. Um, <laughs> and I had not learned at that time to wear dark underwear. Oh. So I had on sort of a nice turquoise blue pair of underwear. <laughs> at the next, during the serenade, I was to take a chair, turn it around, and sit facing the audience with my legs, and I saw this, she had to be 11 years old in the front row. And I said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so what you have to do, you're actually on stage for the full, all the way from the very beginning of the second act until you get past Metà di Voi. And it's about 25, 30 minutes with, you know, yourself wide open. So, of course, <laughs> um, you take Leporello's bag and you place it in the place where it should be to cover things up. But, and then when you run off stage, you've got the dresser sewing you in while you're standing backstage ready to go back on. So that's, that's one of the moments that we have. Charles? Well, thank God nothing like that ever happened to me, but, uh, <laughs> uh, or maybe a knock on wood. But uh, <clears throat> I guess the funniest thing that ever happened to me was uh, when I did my first cozy, which was actu actually in Portland, Oregon. 
And uh, it was a very traditional production of Cozy. So when we came out as the Albanians, we had huge beards and big mustaches like this and turbans. And, and it was, you know, very cartoonish, but it was fun. And um, so I, we started to do it and we were acting very, you know, I was trying to do my best, acting very well. And I was like this, like this. And I happened to just glance on the corner of my eye in the front row, dead center. And I thought someone was playing a joke on me, was a man dressed in white, all white, with a huge turban and a huge beard with earrings, and he was sitting like this. <laughs> well, he was like a sheik, or what, what's the, uh, you know, but they, I started, Sultan. yeah, well, no, I don't know what he was, I, I don't know what he's doing in Portland, Oregon, but whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I thought it was a joke, I don't know. I started to laugh, <coughs> excuse me, so I, I, it, I was literally scratching myself trying, because it was in the middle of a show. But anyway, I found out later once um, that this man, um, he comes, he has a, um, uh, you know, he has a ticket for every show, and he comes all the time sitting in the same seat all the time. And I forget the name of the religion that he belongs to, but... Uh, Sikh. Sikh. Sikh, yeah, he's a Sikh, yeah. Sikh, yeah. But no one told me this before. <laughs> And so I had to, you know, I had a big scratch mark in my arm because, because I was just trying not to laugh. But that's the worst thing that ever happened to me, thank God. Dan <laughs> Danielle? I forgot to think of one. Um, I, th those were so good. No, I've had, love. I think we've all had so many, like, hilarious, crazy things happen. I was trying to think. Actually, when you mentioned uh, your boxers, I remembered one horrible show that I did. Actually, no, it was a great show, but it was a horrible thing that happened to me in the show. Um, I was playing a Moor in Orfeo and Euridice in Naples, in Italy. And uh, Donna Karen was doing the designs, so it was all very high fashion, and I had a huge afro, about, about this big, a red afro, and all gold makeup, and my eyebrows were golded out, and I had to wear a, like a leotard, like a ballet dancer's leotard, and I had to do all these weird Indian like poses and dance, and I had at one point to do a backwards bridge. Um, and one of the shows, they, I didn't know this until I did the bridge, but they had given me a male leotard oh. instead of a female leotard. And the male leotard is a little bit lower. So when I would put it on, I thought like, mm, maybe I'm just feeling a little bloated today or something. And then when I did the bridge, my entire chest came out backwards. So I saw it above me and that was, thoroughly embarrassing I had to stop and um, and then someone backstage was like I think we gave you a man's leotard and I was <laughs> anyway these things happen lots of things like this happen I've been pushed on stage I've gotten locked out from trying to get on stage we all have we could probably sit here for two hours telling you stories I have one real quick one because mine was kind of terrible you know it's kind of a sad thing um, uh, inflator mouse at the Met um, at, the, at the time I did this, Dom, Dom DeLuise was still alive. He was actually fairly healthy. So he played the jailer, and I did Frank. In the third act, I was supposed to come on drunk, you know, and happy, da 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 And right before I went on, I went to the restroom, as we often do before we go on stage, because you don't have any time to do that. Well, I'd forgotten to zip up a particular... Uh, and so we're in a black tuxedo, right? And I'm like Jeff. I had learned not to... Uh, I should have worn something colored, you know, but I had whitey tidy with you know, a white underwear. <laughs> and I came out with it completely exposed. So I sat down, did my thing, and Dom DeLuise was there and he went, Oh. And he pointed right to it and said, What did what happened? I went, Oh my God. Oh, so good. <laughs> Four thousand people were guffawing and laughing, you know. I, <laughs> so I got him back though. I got him back later. <laughs> Following on what John just asked, I'd like to ask and warn our tenor. Uh, Last time we had this, the original production of uh, uh, Pasquale, I had the pleasure of sitting in on a couple of the tech rehearsals and wonderful tenor Polanciani. Uh, there was a little trouble with at the bathtub scene with the <laughs> bubble maker. Yes. So I'd like, uh, our opening opera was Salome and everybody was wondering what is she going to wear, if anything, during the dance. Uh. So. Uh, I'm wondering about the bathtub scene, and I'm warning you, make sure the bubble maker works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we worked out the bubbles, right? Yeah, it yeah, yeah. It's been done many times since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I think I do have a pair of uh, skin-colored bike shorts or something. Do you? Really? Yeah, just, wow. well, yeah, it gets cold up on stage, you know, there's a lot of wind. There was, uh, so, yes, but um, uh, there's a little bit of water, I think, in the bathtub, and other than that, it's mostly bubbles. And uh, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be when safe. We were, <laughs> when we were doing that originally, we were really working with the formula of what it is, because it's not just bubbles. It's Mr. Bubble and Dawn and <laughs> all kinds of stuff, because the bubbles have to have a certain, and there's actually some, some glycerin stuff in there, too, because it has to have a consistency, because the bubbles have to last for eight minutes. Yeah. Oh. And, oh, so, and if you sing yeah. the aria too slow, then that's yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It's impetus to keep the opera moving, yes. keep the opera moving. So we were still nice experimenting though. during those tech rehearsals, but I think we have the formula down pat now. I mean, it's been done a few times. That's so funny. So I need to not make Maestro angry, or else he might slow down the whole aria and leave me there in my underwear. Yeah. Well, lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. We look forward to Don Pasquale. Thank you.